Millions of years ago, before the dawn of man, the turning earth was caught in the dead cold grip of the Ice Age. In those early years, the Ice Age glaciers were at work, plowing out the island water empire. In the beginning, it was very dark, and from the old legends of the Klingit, the creator of heaven and earth was called the Great Raven. It was he who brought daylight to the world. As the earth turns, the first rays of sun strike the waterways of the southeast border. And it's good morning, Alaska. In time, the Ice Age retreated, leaving what is now the Southeast Archipelago, the green necklace of the great land. The state that will lead America north to the future is still in the early morning of development. All states need many things for growth. Among them, natural resources are important. Human resources are vital. But the people who are the state can only progress and go places on highways for communication and transportation. Highways geared to the modern age. However, many Alaskan centers from Kodiak across the Gulf to the communities within the 35,000 square miles of Tongass National Forest, with its mainland mountain and glacier barriers, spruce and hemlock furred islands anchored in a maze of fjords, passages and channels of the sea can only be traversed by water or by air. It was here, where the town of Sitka stands today, that the Russians in the 1700s made their headquarters in tapping the Northland's wealth of furs. And it was here, having sold us the great land, they turned over Alaska to the United States in 1867. Those who ventured to visit Alaska soon discovered that furs were not the only riches. In the southerly island areas, it was a land of mild, moist weather, tempered by warm currents offshore. The clear waters harbored shoals of salmon. This finest of food species had been taken by eager fishermen for centuries. And the wealth of forests had already supplied timber for the first lumbermen. And those who came after them and produced finished boards for house construction and works of art. Today, the history and culture of Alaska is best told by the carving on the early day totem poles. Within a few years, canning and lumbering centers had grown up in the island empire. But there was one thing all these older communities had in common. From Kodiak across the Gulf to Ketchikan, Petersburg, Wrangell, Sitka, and even at the first gold center, Juneau, which became Alaska's capital in 1906. They were isolated by mainland mountain barriers and winding passages of the sea. There was a real need for some modern method to span long stretches of water and then connect to the land. Unlike most American communities, all roads ended beyond the edge of town. Cars had to be shipped in by freighter. There seemed to be no possible way the communities could ever be linked by the modern life-sustaining artery of a motor highway. It would have to stop at the water's edge. This cut out the modern American family way to travel with the kids in the car, camper, or trailer. The only way anyone, resident or tourist, could drive to Alaska from the lower 48 was over the long highway through Canada's North Country. In 1959, after years of struggle and setbacks, Alaska became the youngest state and added the 49th star to the flag.
Finally, for the great land, the morning had come. Signal had been given to go for progress. Now more than ever, a highway that could continue land routes over the water was a necessity. The forerunner of what was to be a solution to the problem was a little, unimpressive ferry called the Chilcat. One thing about it, with a limited cargo of passengers and vehicles, it did provide a limited road from Juneau up the Lynn Canal to Haines. From there, people, as they do today, could drive through a corner of Canada to the vast body of mainland Alaska. This gave a few far-sighted men the concept of a moving road to span the waters and tie our cities in southeast Alaska and on westward together. They called it the Marine Highway. In 1960, a bond issue to build three large, newly designed ferries was authorized and passed. In 1963, the first motor vessel, the first segment of the Marine Highway, went into operation. This was the Malaspina, to run from Prince Rupert in British Columbia to Haines and Skagway by way of the towns of Southeast Alaska. The best expert predictions were far exceeded the first year though the last of the three new ferries was not delivered until June of that year. Here was a real extension of land roads that could take any vehicle that was legal on America's highways up to and including the largest freight trucks. There was far more traffic the first year than had been predicted for the fourth year, and by the end of the fourth year, traffic was five times original predictions. Coming aboard for the first time, passengers find themselves on a vessel with similar attractions to that of a cruise ship. The larger ferries have several types of staterooms for those who want them. Many passengers would as soon relax in the airplane type reclining chairs. There is a snack bar for a quick bite or a meal, or self-service refreshment at any time. For those who prefer a full-course dinner, there is a dining room with excellent food and courteous service. There are no traffic worries, no exhaust fumes, and no wear and tear on the nerves in this kind of highway travel. The passengers can relax and leave the driving to the captain, while the operation of the propulsion power is handled by the engine room crew, who have charge of the big diesel twin engines totaling 8,000 horsepower to 17,750 horsepower per ship. The horsepower that makes it possible for traffic to smoothly move while the cars are safely parked and the motorists enjoy life. There is even Forest Service personnel aboard in the summer to help acquaint newcomers with the great land. Leading Seattle in summer, Alaska-bound passengers are advised to make ferry reservations for their cars. In fact, the entire system is on a full reservation basis, except for the foot passengers. This goes for Alaska residents as well, who are on their way home after pleasure or business in the lower 48. Ferry departures are prompt, so don't take a chance on being left behind. Beginning in late fall, Residents of Alaska are not traveling as often, and there is more space for the growing winter and early spring tourist traffic, which takes advantage of southeast Alaska's mild weather and the scenic interior. On the inside passage, you are never out of sight of land, and the most spectacular scenery in the world. Once across the border into U.S. waters, the ferry is in Tongass National Forest, maintained forever for the benefit of the original inhabitants. In the narrow sections, the shores are so close, the wildlife can enjoy watching the travelers. The Wrangell Narrows call for expert navigation from the wheelhouse, with only a few feet leeway on either side of the huge vessel. 
In spite of Alaska being a virtual wilderness on every side, some of the state's greatest industries are here in the southeast archipelago. Southeast Alaska, up until the war years, supplied the mainstay of Alaska's economy. The forests are our greatest renewable natural resource. Under a plan to harvest mature trees and make way for new growth, supervised cutting of timber in the area feeds a woods product industry around communities like Ketchikan, whose biggest operation provides one of the largest payrolls in the state. The trees are a crop that under skilled forest management will be continually renewed to ensure jobs and income for years ahead. Not only around Ketchikan, but Wrangell, Petersburg and Sitka and all the other forest communities. In this water world, fish are the basis of a great food industry and support another large workforce who in turn support the people who provide the services and supplies. Wrangell, first ferry stop north of Ketchikan, is another fish and woods product center. Next oldest southeast settlement to Sitka, it was established as a Russian fort in 1834. This stop is a real plus for the rock hunting tourists who find garnets plentiful in the area. Petersburg, first port above Wrangell Narrows, is younger, beginning as a fishing port in 1897. It is considered one of the wealthiest cities per capita in the world. Only a few miles from Petersburg lies Laconte Glacier, one of the most active glaciers in the state. Juneau, at the foot of a towering mountain complex, is America's most scenic state capital. Gold was discovered here in 1880, but the mines have long been idle, though one is still a tourist attraction. Other attractions are the Capitol and the Governor's Mansion, dating from 1912. Visitors also flock to Mendenhall Glacier. The ice face is up to 200 feet high, and the glacier is retreating at the rate of 90 feet a year. From Juneau northbound, our next stop is Haines and Port Chilkoot. This is a center of native culture, and the Chilkat Indian dancers are world famous. From Haines, the land road leads across a corner of Canada to central Alaska. The farthest North Ferry stop is Skagway. This was the gateway to the gold rush to Canada's Klondike. Gold seekers left here for the famed Chilkoot Pass over the mountains to the Yukon Territory. The town's population then was 20,000. Today, it is only a fraction of that. But the days of old are relived for the tourists in the summer-long Trail of 98 pageant. White Pass route leads to Whitehorse in the Yukon. Today, mineral concentrates from Canada provide heavy freight for this route. Over this railroad, or the highway to Haines, Alaskans from Fairbanks or Anchorage can come south to explore the Green Islands and the historic and scenic towns of the Southeast Archipelago, as well as their state capital. Since the coming of the Marine Highway, the road for the people of Southeast no longer ends a few miles out of town. In the family car or camper, they can take off over the water for any destination that can be reached by road in Alaska or all of North America. Residents or out-of-state visitors can travel the Southeast Panhandle in their own vehicles for sightseeing, for camping, for fishing, or business. They can go on to the mainland of Alaska by way of the Haines Road to Toke Junction and swing north to Fairbanks or south to Anchorage. 
From these cities, they can make a relatively inexpensive air excursion to the Arctic or drive to the scenic wonderland of Mount McKinley National Park. Here they will find that the original inhabitants have learned to tolerate human visitors. To serve the southwest segment of the marine highway system, a ferry leaves Anchorage on a regular summer schedule and travels down Cook Inlet by way of the huge offshore oil rigs to touch at Kenai, Homer, Seldovia, Kodiak, and Seward. The motor vessel Tustamina has a unique built-in elevator that makes possible the handling of vehicles at any port in any tide condition. As a result of the passage of a bond issue, this vessel was lengthened by being cut in two and having a specially engineered section welded in. This added to the vehicle capacity and increased the number of staterooms. The Tustamina serves the workforce of the oil industry centered around Kenai, the Kenai Peninsula, and Homer, a fishing and farming community. Seldovia, another seafood center with no land road connection, also depends on the marine highway for vehicle transportation. From here, the overwater artery runs to Kodiak Island, the land of the giants. In the wilds beyond town is the Kodiak bear, largest carnivorous animal alive. From the sea comes another giant, the king crab. Kodiak, of course, is the king crab capital of the world. The canneries here also process salmon, halibut, clams, and shrimp. From Kodiak, the ferry moves north to Seward. This harbor, ice-free in winter, is Tustamina's home port. Seward is connected to Anchorage and Fairbanks by land highway and by the Alaska Railroad. Northeast of Seward is Prince William Sound. At the head of Valdez Arm is the town of Valdez. Tied to inland centers by a year-round highway that runs through scenic Thompson Pass, one of the heaviest snowfall areas of the state. Valdez is to be the southern terminus of the pipeline to the North Slope oil field. At opposite ends of the sound are Cordova and Whittier. They are connected to the land road at Valdez by a smaller segment of the marine highway, the motor vessel E.L. Bartlett. The Bartlett is the result of special design efforts requiring two years. Just short of 200 feet in length, it can carry 165 passengers and load 35 cars through the nighthead bow or by the stern ramp. This makes loading or unloading possible at either end. To take a car to Cordova until a land road is built, one must take the marine highway. 95% of passengers who arrive here are residents of Alaska. However, tourists are now discovering Cordova because of its beautiful setting and the abundance of wildlife in the area. The water route from Whittier to Valdez is 95 miles, 400 by land road. To residents of Anchorage, the weekend circle tour is popular. Drive to Whittier with a short section of the trip aboard Alaska Railroad cars. The Bartlett to Valdez. Folks, you can take a look forward and to your right off the starboard bow. There's a cliff coming up there with a bird rookery. We'll pull right past so you have a good look. Then drive back to Anchorage by road. But whether on business, pleasure, or honeymoon, the Marine Highway makes the Prince William Sound trip easy, and passengers enjoy one of the greatest cruises on Earth as they relax. There is wildlife for sure. The valleys are filled with moose, the rivers with fish. And high above in the lofty crags lives the mountain goat, most sure-footed of all animals. There is sea life in the blue-green waters of the Sound, from sea lions to leaping whales. 
but creeping rivers of prehistoric ice provide the greatest spectacle of all, especially the Columbia Glacier, where skyscraper-sized monoliths crack off and collapse from the ice cliff in splintering thunder. The Bartlett design immediately proved so successful that to expand service in the southeast, two more similar vessels are required. The state of Alaska is working on extending the marine highway through bond issues authorized by the legislature in Juneau. By the latter part of the 1960s, there was a real need for far-sighted planning that would further provide a water road network to tie all segments of the great land together. At the same time, planning that will provide for the future flow of traffic that already has passed all predictions and expectations. From a vessel leaving Sitka, gliding up along the Alexander Archipelago through the playground of the Great Way. Not so far south now lies the lower 48. To the west, 5,000 miles away, lies Japan. Across the Gulf is another sea arm of Alaska. Kodiak, Katmai National Monument, Homer, and all the southwest. Many people have long dreamed of making a visit to Alaska. As governor of Alaska, it's my privilege to invite each and every one of you to come and visit Alaska, the great land. In time to come, the Marine Highway, aboard a seagoing motor vessel, will connect the loose ends in the southwest and southeast to form an in-state system that circulates traffic between the mainland heart and the outer fringes. This will further ensure a United States route from Seattle to the southeast, to Anchorage and on to Fairbanks, and eventually the Arctic, to tie Alaska and the lower 48 in a motor road network that moves traffic across oceans and mainland barriers. Over this wide-reaching road that spans seas, channels, and inlets, as well as mountains, lakes, rivers, muskeg, and arctic permafrost, the great land will lead America north to the future.